you there. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Let's go on to eight. Then Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of all beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. For this is he. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are awesome, Lord, that you inhabit our praises, God. We thank you, Lord, that you look on the inside, God. You don't look on the outside, Lord. You don't look on our appearance, Lord. You don't look on the outside, God. You see the inside, Lord. Open up our hearts and minds and allow us, Lord, to receive something from you today. And we'll never fail to give you praise and glory and honor. And the church says, Amen. 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 We must understand today that God decides our worth. God decides your worth. Nobody else. Uh, we must understand this today that God decides your worth. Nobody else decides your worth but God. When you, when you apply for a loan or you, you begin to buy a house, there's a credit score that, that, that they must obtain. There's three scores that they must obtain. And after they obtain these three scores, they decide whether you're worth the risk of lending to. That's something that happens when you buy a house or you buy a car. You go through all these things and you sign all these papers and you go through all this stuff just to see if you are worth the risk of that bank lending to you. And then after you, they decide whether you're worth the risk, and then they tack on the interest and then all those things. Then you sign your name a thousand times, and then if you don't pay your payment, the bank calls or the repo man comes. But all those things happen. But for my debt of sin, God decided that I'm worth his son. Hallelujah. 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 I'm worth the risk. I'm worth the debt of his son. I am worth the crucified Savior. I am worth that. If you're not, you don't think you're worth anything to anybody, you're worth something to God. You're worth so much that he would send his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God has decided your worth, nobody else. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God decides your value. It's God's decision and He decided that you are worth it. Nobody else, not your family, your husband, your wife, not your parents, the boss, the, the company you work for, all these people, they don't decide your value. They don't get the opportunity to decide what you're worth. God decides your value and He decided Amen. it 2,000 years ago. He decided that you're worth the death of and the crucifying of his son. God decides your work. Nobody else. My self-esteem cannot be swayed by someone else's opinion of me. I cannot be depressed. The child of God should not be discouraged. Our mental state should not be stirred, disturbed through life's troubles and uh, tribulations. I cannot be swayed by life's circumstances. No disturbance, no disruption can sway my confidence. And I read this scripture often, but it's in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that we, uh, the excellency of the power of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. You may say, Jason, I've heard this scripture a thousand times from you, but I'm getting it in my spirit, and I'm getting it in yours, that it doesn't matter what happens in life. God's got your back. God decides your worth. Nobody else. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 
He won't leave me when it gets rough. He won't uh, forsake me when it gets hard. God will never leave me nor forsake me. He's going all the way with me, even to the end of the world. The Bible declares in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls. God has decided that you're worth joy. You're worth peace. You're worth all these things. You're worth a peaceful life. You're worth joy. Uh, sorrow may last for a night, but God declares in His Word, joy cometh in the morning. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The smile on my face and the joy in my heart cannot be determined by someone else's perception of me. Because God has decided that you're worth so much to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The clothes on your back or the, the money in your bank account or the car that you drive or the job that you go to every morning, that does not decide your value. That's right. God yeah. decides your value. Hallelujah. God decides your worth. Hallelujah. Yes. I can't be swayed by Ooh. someone else's perception of me. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He allows Christ to live on the inside of us. We're worth so much to God. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My happiness and peace rest in Jesus and the finished work of the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. The finished work, what Jesus done on the cross 2,000 years ago decided my value. Amen. An event that I never saw. An event that I never witnessed. An event that I never attended. This event means more to me than anything that has ever taken place on this planet. I wasn't there when they crowned him with thorns. I wasn't there when they uh, speared his side. I wasn't there when they put nails in his hands and a nail in his feet. I wasn't there when they uh, mocked him and they spit upon him and they cast lots for his robe and they gave him vinegar to drink and he carried a cross uphill. I wasn't there when that nail went through my Savior's hand. I wasn't there when the nails went through my Savior's feet. But this event means more to me than anything that has ever taken place yes. on this yes. planet. He has decided that I'm worth the death and the resurrection of His Son. You're worth something to Jesus. Amen. think that you're worth anything to anybody. You may feel alone. You may feel depressed. But you're worth something to the Savior. You're worth something to the King of Kings and the Lord of your Lords. God decides your worth. Nobody else. Hallelujah. I feel His presence, don't you? An event that redeemed me. An event that set me free. An event that loosed my chains. An event that heals the brokenhearted. An event that gives me hope and joy and peace. An event that uh, puts me uh, uh, where there's uh, uh, walls of jasper and there's gates of pearl. An event where there's streets of gold. And this event means more to me. And He has a plan to get us up there. Yes, Lord. You're worth heaven to the Savior. That you're worth, He's building a mansion way up on glory for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're not saved today, make a decision in your life today. You are worth heaven to God. Hallelujah. I've never thought about that for, before till now. You're worth heaven where there's streets of gold and there's walls of jasper. You can't compare what's down here to what he's preparing for you up there. Hallelujah. 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 Let's go back to 1 Samuel 16. Let's start in verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on alive and said, Surely the Lord's anointed one is before him. But Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. 
For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I'm so glad he looks on the inside. Yes. David on the outside should have never conquered a bear. David on the outside should have never conquered a lion. David on the outside should have never defeated a Goliath. But God, who is rich in mercy, wasn't concerned with David's physical appearance. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about the uh, outside, the outward appearance of David. He wasn't concerned with this. He was looking for someone that would trust him. Someone that would fight with no armor. Uh, some, someone uh, that would trust God even if all he had was a few stones and a slingshot. God looks on the inside. God was looking for someone that would praise him without reservation. Is that you today? That you'll praise him in the middle of the storm. You'll praise him when all around is failing. You'll praise him. You can be uh, like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that uh, bringeth forth fruit in in due season. Hallelujah. You can be that man. God has decided your value. Accept it. You have to accept God's value of you. God was looking for someone that would bring his presence back to his people when he found this in David. They didn't think it was David, but it was David. Verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this one down. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by and said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this another one down. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these seven down. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Hallelujah. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. He was talking down. He, he wasn't presenting David the way David should have really been presented. He said, He keepeth the sheep. That's all he is, is a shepherd boy. You mean something to God today. That's all he is, is a shepherd boy. I, I got him on the hillside all by himself, just keeping the sheep. He's not worth much. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes. Come yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will not sit down till he comes. David's father, uh, Jesse, didn't even consider him. He, he's just a ruddy little shepherd boy. I didn't even want to waste your time with him, Samuel. He, he is nothing too young, too little. It's not worth your trouble. And he sinned and brought him in verse 12. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is he. This is he. This is the shepherd boy. Everybody else may have forgotten you, but God does not forget you. God does not make a mistake with you. God has chosen for you to do something mighty for him. I'm looking at his heart. I'm looking at his faith. I'm looking at his love for me. I'm looking at his desire for me. I'm looking on the inside. God sees the innermost part of our being. He looks right through us. He knows what's on the inside. You may think that nobody knows your hopes and dreams. God knows your hopes and dreams. And he's cheering you on. He's cheering you on. He, he, he's like the whole stadium crowd saying, go, go. You can score. You can make it. You can make the touchdown. You can win the game. You can make it to heaven. There's joy at the end of it all. Amen. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Yeah. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. God was saying to David that your appearance doesn't matter to me. What your father Jesse says about you doesn't matter to me. He may have chose everybody else but you. He may have even left you out of the process. But my thoughts and my plans 
A few of you are different. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. David's future was to be king. David's future was to save his people from a giant named Goliath. David's future was to bring the glory and the presence of God back to his people. This was God's plan for David. God was preparing him while he was tending the sheep. God was saying that if you can protect this, then you can rule over that. Don't look down on small beginning. God may be preparing you uh, for that. You may just be in the sound booth, Jason Michaels. You may just be in the sound booth, Jason Michaels. You, you may think that that's all you'll ever be is in the sound booth. Hit and play on soundtracks. But I have something for you, Jason. Hallelujah. And God took a beautiful woman by the name of Sharon Taylor and she spoke a word over me and said, Jason, I got plans for you. God has mighty plans for you. The sound booth is nice. It's getting you uh, where you need to go. That's okay. But I got big plans for you. You may just be learning the notes on the keyboard. You may just be learning uh, the, the chords on the guitar. You may just be learning the beats on the drums. But I have plans for you. You're going to touch lives. You're going to see people saved. And that's every one of us in this sanctuary today. You're a part of touching lives. When somebody uh, in Australia or uh, Europe clicks on a YouTube video and they see us praising and worshiping the King and they see us ministering the gospel uh, from this pulpit, you're part of that. Amen. Amen. You're worth something to the kingdom of God. I can think about my, my buddy Corey. I don't know when he first learned how to play it's hard. I don't remember what happened. I don't, I don't really know the whole story, but I do know that God was preparing him to play in the worship band here at church. When he was learning guitar chords, I don't know if you were a child. What, when did you start playing, Corey? At 13 years old. You think when Corey was 13, God had plans for him to be right there. Amen. God has a plan for you. If you'll follow, if you'll follow Him, if you'll have moments with the King, uh, uh, if if you'll if you'll uh, stay on course for God, He has plans for you. Hallelujah! When He was learning those guitar chords and and, and He had His uh, guitar, no no doubt in His bedroom, God was preparing Him to help us lead worship to where we could go into the presence of God and chains can be broken. God's preparing you for something. Enjoy it. God's preparing you. I can remember there was uh, many times we led worship at youth events, and, and, and you guys remember Eddie May. He's so funny. Mm -hmm. He don't even know how goofy he is. <laughs> I love him. I talked to him yesterday. But I can remember a time we were leading worship. Jeremy was on the bass, and I was on a, a little keyboard. It had 61 keys. That's it. It sounded horrible. If I played it now, I'd probably cry. <laughs> Jeremy had this old Johnson bass, and it wasn't much. And we had just a little old tiny, uh, we had just a little old tiny bass amp, and and I can remember uh, uh, Eddie was on the drums, or Brother Joplin was on the drums, and there we were in this youth event. But God was preparing us for something at that moment. God was preparing us to lead worship. God was preparing us to be in His presence. Yeah. Hallelujah! Right. And I can remember those times. They're so precious. And we enjoyed them so much. But God was preparing us for what we are doing today. Hallelujah. Don't look down on small beginnings. For I know the plans I have for you. God was saying, I know your worth. I know your value. Nobody else. I know who you are on the inside. I know the hidden talents inside of you. God knows all of these things. And we should, we should enjoy the journey. I was, I was listening to a, a sermon of Dad's, and I believe it may have been a year ago when uh, he was talking about enjoying the journey. We should enjoy the journey. Man. We should enjoy uh, life. We should enjoy people. I was listening to one of your sermons yesterday, uh, and it, the sermon was titled, What Makes You Happy?
the small things in life we should enjoy. What makes me happy is being all by myself. And uh, Miranda was at work yesterday, and it was just me and McKinley, and we were watching Tinkerbell. Now, I would rather be watching the Philadelphia Eagles game or UK game, but at that moment, I enjoyed so much watching Tinkerbell with my baby girl. Enjoy life. It's precious. It's precious, those moments in life. Turn over to Mark 10, verse 46. This is one of my favorite guys. God decides your worth, amen? Mark 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, uh, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timmy, is set by the highway side begging. His worth to society was just a few tossed coins, for he was a beggar. His worth to society was whatever you had that was left over. You, you can have my surplus, man, uh, my extra. That's all you're worth to me. You're a beggar. You can have the change in my pocket. That was his worth to society. Verse 47, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He began to cry out to Jesus because he heard about this man. Uh, he heard how he healed the sick and how he delivered and how he cared for the poor and he cared for the disease. He, he knew that, that to Jesus he was worth, worth more than just change. He was m worth more than just the coins in your pocket. To Jesus he was worth so much more than that. He was uh, worth more than just a, a beggar on the highway side. He was more than his poor reputation. He was more than his financial state. He was more to Jesus. Verse 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. You see, this was blind Bartimaeus' moment. And he would have to seize this moment in order to get his healing from the Master. It was his destiny. And in that moment when he was on the brink of his miracle, just moments away, Jesus was just allowed to cry away. And he, he was charged or demanded to hold his peace. This man was dependent on, on the livelihood of others. But at this moment, he had to forsake the advice of others, the ones that were going to toss him chains, the one that he depended on for his livelihood. He had to forsake their advice because he was searching after an answer for the king. And Jesus stood still. Hallelujah. He was saying, I, I may need, be not, not worth the disruption to you. I may just be a burden to you. I may not be worth the trouble to you. I may not be worth anything to you. But to this man, Jesus, I'm worth something. You are worth something to Jesus. Can I get that across to you today? You're worth something to the Savior. Hallelujah. I'm not going to quiet down. I have to get Jesus' attention. I'm not giving up because to Jesus, I'm worth something. And Jesus stood still for His voice stopped Jesus. His voice disrupted the travel of the Savior. If we'll get a little louder than the noise of our life and we'll cry out to Jesus, right. have moments with the Savior, That's have it. moments with the King while you're driving down the road all by yourself. Uh, this, this week I was on my way uh, to a football game. Pikeville played Hazard in the uh, state semifinals. But we, I was on my way to Hazard. And I, and I, was, uh, I could have rode with someone else and that would have been okay to ride with someone else. But I thought, I'm going to spend the gas money it takes to get there. And I'm going to have me a moment with Jesus. That's it. That's it. Now, some may say, that's crazy. You could have saved some money. It's priceless to have a moment with the king. You can't put a price tag on being in his presence. I was going to drive all the way to Hazard. I made a couple of phone calls. But in between those phone calls, I was having me a time with the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody may say, that's crazy. I learned that off my pop off. If you rode with Papa half the time he, his hands were on the wheel and half the time they were in the air praising the Lord. I don't know if that was smart or not. But he was having moments with the king wherever he went. That's what I learned from him. In verse 50, and he casting away his garment, his garment which gave him the right 
to be. The right to be there at that moment. Uh, this garment certified him to be a beggar. And upon this garment was where the coins would be tossed. Every day and at night the same garment would keep him warm and give him comfort. This garment was his dependency. But at that moment, when he got the attention of Jesus, that garment was no longer of any worth to him. For he cast away the garment, the Bible declares, and he rose and he came to Jesus. Yeah. His dependence. This was, this was his sole prized possession, was this garment. This was, this was his livelihood. Everything that he had was dependent upon this garment. And he threw it aside when he heard about Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Your faith, it was, it was blind Bartimaeus' decision to be healed. He already says that he's the God that healeth thee. Blind Bartimaeus had to get it in his mind that he was worth a touch from Jesus. You are worth a touch from the Master. He decided that you are worth a touch from Him. You are worth, when you lift your hands, you are worth a touch from Jesus. When you enter into this sanctuary or you're driving down the road in your car, God is willing and able to touch you no matter where you're at. Mark 5 and 25, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. You see, she had 12 years of pain and struggle and disease and 12 years of I don't know what I'm going to do and 12 years of searching for answers. In verse 26, and suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. The doctors gave up on her. She was supposed to be exiled from contact with others due to her disease, due to her condition. Uh, the worth that she had to those physicians was no longer, she was no longer on their priority because her value had diminished. Why? Because she had spent all that she had. She had spent everything that she had, so her value to the physicians, she was the low man on the totem pole. But to Jesus, he don't care what you have. It doesn't matter to Jesus what's in your bank account. It doesn't matter to Jesus what your last name is. It doesn't matter to Jesus what you're wearing, uh, the clothes on your back or the shoes on your feet. It doesn't matter to Jesus. So that's why when she crawled to him, Jesus never turned around and said, what do you have to give me? Jesus, when she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus said, who touched me? You know what he was really saying? He was saying, who decided that they're worth a touch from me? Yeah. you you got to get that today. Somebody say amen. Amen. She, when she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus was like, who touched me? Who decided that they're worth a touch from the master? Everyone in this room is worth a touch from the king. When he bore stripes on his back for your healing, it didn't exclude anyone. God decides your worth. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, yeah. she decided she is worth the touch. And straightway the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press. And we've already talked about this. Who touched me? Who decided that sickness must go? Who decided that the sickness has got to leave? Who decided that they're worth a touch from the king? Hallelujah. One of my favorite stories is the man on the right and the left side of Jesus. The man on the right side of Jesus, he decided that he was worth something to Jesus when he said, Lord, remember me. You see, Jesus hanging on the cross in the darkest hour of his life, in the most hurtful time, of his life. And he was in the garden and the sweat became drops of blood because he knew what the cross was. He knew everything that went into the whipping post. I believe 
that he was preparing himself for the mental part of the cross and all the things that went with it. And this man on the right side of Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me. And his worth to Jesus was so large that Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You see, you're worth something to Jesus. You're worth something to Jesus. Hallelujah. You're worth something to the Savior. Blind Bartimaeus, he was worth something to Jesus. When Jesus healed his blind eyes, and the woman with the issue of blood, she was worth something to Jesus. For we know when she touched the hem of his garment. You see, you may not think that you're worth anything to anybody. But to Jesus, you're worth something. To Jesus, you're worth the death and the resurrection. You're worth so much to Jesus. And I love this song that was written. For when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. For he knew me, yet he loved me. You see, you're worth something to Jesus. You're worth something to the Savior. No matter what hardships and no matter what goes on in your life, you must decide that you are worth something to the Savior.